All right. Welcome back to ABA exam review and our latest BCBA exam practice question series, where we're going through the next set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for all of our study materials, including our famous combo pack. As always, when you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. You, a behavior analyst, design an extinction procedure targeting a client's use of inappropriate language at inappropriate times. If you determine your technician is implementing the procedure with fidelity, then what has occurred? Now, what we need to focus on in this question is what the question is asking. And it sounds like common sense, but that's where you should always start because... This is a shorter question, but when they give you a lot of information, it's going to be your job to figure out what 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 part of that information do I need to use to answer the question. In this case, what they're worried about is you determining your technician is implementing the procedure with fidelity. And if you determine that, what has occurred? And in the context, right, it can be a little confusing because the beginning just says, well, you designed an extinction procedure targeting the client's use of inappropriate language. Now, we're not asking about extinction. We're not asking about the effectiveness of extinction. We're asking about, did they implement the procedure with fidelity? And what does that mean? So A, the extinction procedure is effective and the client experienced an extinction burst. Just because the implementation has fidelity does not mean it's effective. It could be implemented perfectly with perfect fidelity, still be ineffective. It could just be a bad intervention. B, the extinction procedure is effective. Again, fidelity doesn't mean effective. Fidelity means you've implemented it or your technician has implemented it as you wrote it up. As described or as prescribed is how they did it. So C is really what we're looking for. The procedure is implemented correctly. You can implement extinction correctly all you want. You can implement your procedure correctly all you want. Sometimes it's just ineffective and that's just the way it goes. So even though you may have fidelity, it might just simply be ineffective. And the D, the procedure is implemented incorrectly. If you determine the procedure has fidelity, you're simply saying the technician or whoever is implementing it is doing it as you wrote it. So it was, they're implementing it correctly. So our answer is going to be C, the procedure is implemented correctly. Ben enters into a contract with an adult home, which houses individuals with low impact disabilities. At the outset of the relationship, Ben is given a set of files which contain treatment plans for all of the individuals in the house. He is told to get to work on Monday and follow those exact plans. What should Ben do? Okay, we have to think about this. Question is asking about Ben and what he should do. So what should he do relative to what? Well, we know he just entered into a contract with an adult home, so he's some sort of contractor, right? Some third party. At the outset of the relationship, so at the beginning, he's given a set of files with treatment plans for the individuals in the house. At least pretty standard, right? We need to review historical notes, historical data, historical plans. But then he's told to get to work on Monday and follow those exact plans. Is there something wrong with that? Does Ben need to do something other than what he was told? A. Since this is a contract job, Ben should start on Monday using the plans. Just because you're contracted out by a school or a group home or whoever doesn't mean you don't have to follow our ethical code. If you know that there's a more ethical and a better way to do it, you have to do it that way. And that might mean sacrificing the contract. That might mean sacrificing a job. That's just the way it goes. So Ben, just because it's under contract, doesn't mean he should go in and start doing things he knows are unethical. B, Ben needs to conduct his own FBA before beginning treatment. Yes. No matter what, if you get a case transfer, if you get a new new client, if you get a contract client, you have to do your own FBAs before beginning treatment. You've got to see things with your own eyes. You've got to do your own evaluation. You can't just go off of what other people prescribe because it might just be wrong. C, Ben needs to verify the plans with the prior case manager before beginning the plans. Well, no, he, he needs to do his own FBAs. Um, the prior case manager might say, yeah, everything looks good. Go ahead and implement it, and it could be terrible. Or it's just unethical to use other people's plans without doing your own assessment. Ben needs to conduct his own assessments. D, since the adult home does not follow the BACB code, Ben should terminate the contract. Well, the only people obligated to follow the code are behavior analysts, behavior technicians, ABA practitioners, certified 
under the board. Adult homes, schools, parents, anybody else, they're not obligated to follow our code. However, we are, and we have to follow it as directed. So what should Ben do in this situation? He needs to conduct his own FBA before beginning treatment. A behavior analyst has hired and assigned five cases. During her interview, she was told she would never have more than 10 cases. However, one year later, she now has 15 cases and barely has time to see everyone on a consistent basis. Other analysts at the company don't see what the big deal is as they have even more cases. Is this an ethical issue? Extremely common. Case creep, right? Slowly but surely, you go from five cases to take one more, to take one more, all the way, and now you've got 15, 20 cases, you're overwhelmed, you're burnt out, clients aren't getting good care. It's a mess. So what's happened here? She was told, well, you can't have more than 10 cases. Now she's up to 15, and her coworkers are saying, well, it's not a big deal because I have more. That's a problem, right? Is this an ethical issue? It absolutely is. So A, no, this is not because it, this is strictly a business issue between the analyst and the company. Well, it's not. It's affecting the client. It's affecting the analyst. Clients aren't getting good care. It's too many cases. She, she can't see everyone on a consistent basis. That's unethical. B, no, this is a personal issue if the behavior analyst is unable to handle her caseload. Well, if she has 10 cases and can't handle them, maybe that's something to do with her. She's up to 15 cases and just literally can't see everyone on a consistent basis. It's got nothing to do with the personal issue. This is a time thing, right? It's unethical to take more cases than you can handle. C, yes, the behavior analyst must have a manageable caseload. That's it, right? You have to have a manageable caseload. These other analysts might be able to handle it. Maybe they really can, right? Maybe they really can, and that's their thing. She can't, and that's okay. You have to know your limits. You have to know what's acceptable, and you have to adjust from there. Now, if she drops down to 10, and now they want to pay her less money, and that becomes more of a business thing, right? Um, but if she can't see everyone on a, a consistent basis with 15 cases, that's unethical. And then D, not enough information to determine. Well, we've got enough information, and it's just pretty clear, right? She can't manage it, and ethically, she must have a manageable caseload. So our answer is going to be C. A four-year-old boy sits on the couch with an iPad. He is watching a video of a man building a Lego set. He rewinds the same sequence and watches it over and over ten times in a row. Function of the behavior is most likely what? You've probably seen this before with children, um, especially on the autism spectrum, where they might watch a YouTube video and then rewind that same part over and over and over again, right? And they do this when somebody's around, when nobody's around. It doesn't take anybody else to engage in this behavior and get the consequence, right? Get the feedback. So when that's when that's the case, when they're when the the consequence is not socially mediated and it's it's just delivered by oneself, what do we consider that? Well, a tangible. Is he trying to obtain a tangible? He's not, right? And tangibles are typically socially mediated. Either way, he's not obtaining a tangible here. B, attention. Attention is always socially mediated. He's not getting the attention of anybody. C, escape. Well, he's not escaping from anybody. He's sitting on the couch doing this behavior over and over and over again. The function of this behavior is most likely automatic, right? It's It doesn't involve social mediation. There's not another person delivering or helping, or he's not trying to gain anything from somebody else. He's simply doing this because it, quote unquote, feels good. So the function of this behavior is most likely D, automatic. Nathaniel is playing video games in his room by himself. His parents are gone for the weekend, so he has the house to himself all weekend. Playing video games in this scenario is considered a what? Okay, careful here, right? Back to back. Don't get confused on this question. It's a different question entirely. We're looking at playing video games in this scenario. So we know he's in his room by himself. His parents are gone. He's at the house by himself. Does that make playing video games a private event? Does not. The only difference between a public event and a private event is a public event, another person is able to describe it. A private event, the only person who can describe it is the person who it's happening to. Just because Nathaniel is currently playing video games by himself, doesn't mean that if somebody else was there, they couldn't describe it. So if there's a situation where a behavior occurs and if somebody else was observing it, can they describe it? If they can, it's a public event. If they can't, it's a private event. And it's not a socially mediated event. 
Public, private, and socially mediated are three different things. Socially mediated means there's another person there. There's not. It can be a public event, but not a socially mediated event, which is the case here. Nathaniel is simply playing video games by himself in his room, so it's not socially mediated. But if somebody else was there, they could describe what he's doing, making it a public event. Latency and inter-response time are related to what? All right, kind of an easy fluid uh, fluency definition question, right? Pretty straightforward. We've got repeatability, temporal locus, temporal extent, and discontinuous measurement. We know it's not discontinuous measurement because latency and inter-response time are continuous. Repeatability refers to rate or count. Temporal extent refers to duration. Temporal locus, a location in time, refers to latency and inter-response time. And it makes sense when you think about it. We're looking at a location in time. Latency is the time in between an SD and a response. Location and time. Inter-response time, time in between responses. Location and time. So latency and inter-response time are related to B, temporal locus. Listener behavior, according to Cooper et al., is the more modern version of which of the following terms? Okay, listener behavior, right? When you tell somebody to do something, you are the speaker. When they do it, they are the listener. If you're at a rock concert and the singer says, everybody sing along, and you do, the singer is the speaker, you're the listener. So what's another version or what's another term for listener behavior? A, receptive instruction. Good. A lot of times we refer to programs as receptive instruction, teaching listeners to follow commands and directions. B, expressive instruction. Expressive instruction is telling somebody something. C, speaker behavior, same thing, using your voice to tell somebody something. And then D, functional communication. What well, isn't a functional communication? It's simply just following receptive instructions. Listener behavior is following what you're, you're told, right? So the more modern version of receptive instruction is listener behavior. One of your behavior technicians, L, was in a sorority in college. You recently found out that her best friend and sorority sister is the mom of a client you just assigned her to yesterday. What is the best way to proceed? Ethical question, right? We've got L, a sorority girl in college. She is now on a case. And you find out that the mom of the, the stakeholder on the case is, was L's best friend. Is that a problem? Well, it is. That's that's a conflict of interest, right? There's already a dual relationship established. Not acceptable. So how should you proceed? A, make L aware of the dual relationship and conflict of interest clauses in the BACB ethical code. Sure, but is that going to be the best way? That doesn't solve the issue of her being on the case. B, reprimand L for not alerting you to this fact sooner. Well, no, she might not have known. She might not have think it was a, thought it was a big deal. And you found out anyway. So reprimanding her is not going to fix anything. C, remove L from the case immediately. Yes, it's, it's just unethical. There's already this past relationship. She's not going to be objective. It's got to come off. D, proceed with the case, but be cautious that L might develop a personal relationship with the family. That's already been established. There's no avoiding it. The best way to proceed here is just remove L from the case immediately. The optimal time to begin an intervention after taking baseline data is when? So when you're taking baseline data, you're taking data on what is occurring before intervention starts. And so you need to figure out what's the best time to stop baseline and start actual intervention. And in ABA, there's a couple different reasons to end baseline and start intervention. So A, when the behavior is already improving. Well, if your behavior is improving, there might not be a need for intervention. If the behavior is increasing, or decreasing depending on what you're doing, you don't need to intervene. Let it improve, right? Don't mess with it. B, when baseline reaches a steady state, that's ideal. When baseline's in a steady, even state, intervention is now safe to begin. C, after five data points of baseline. Now, that's tricky, right? There's no standard for how many baseline data points you need. One or two typically isn't enough. What about three? Well, if you get three steady state baselines, Maybe so. If you get three baseline points that are going straight downwards and you're trying to increase something, maybe so. So five data points is arbitrary. As is D, two weeks of baseline data collection. That's just an arbitrary number, right? It doesn't mean anything in context of starting your intervention. So the optimal time to begin an intervention after taking baseline data is going to be B, when baseline reaches a steady state. Excellent. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. 
As always, like, subscribe. Let us know when you pass so we can include you in a stunning shout-out. Work hard. Study hard.